Hi viewers, me and team here. Welcome back to Let's Play Civilization 4. And um, I have some unfortunate news. My live commentary for this was not recorded. So I'm doing post commentary again! Anyway, as you can see, I dated myself just a little bit there. Yeah, yeah, number one super guy. If you don't get what that is, you're probably a little bit younger, or you just miss obscure cartoon references from way back in the day. But anyway, uh, I'm going to play as the main team, not as uh, some Hong Kong fooey or some such. And for your killing pleasure, we'll do an extra AI. And I've been getting requests to uh, run with uh, the Vikings on an archipelago map. I don't know. I guess you guys really just wanted it to be easier on me after seeing me get stomped in the Boudicca Let's Play. So, you're like, oh yeah, play the, one of the best water saves on a water map. And go ahead and stomp the AI's face without even trying. So, I picked Snaky Continents because... The, the archipelago maps, they're a little bit micro-intensive inherently. And I don't want to deal with, like, tons and tons of tiny islands on top of it. So, I picked a more reasonable archipelago thing. Plus, it's more realistic. So, here we are with a uh, very obvious capital to settle in place and you know when I looked at it I was actually a little bit surprised it's an unusual capital in that uh, well the Vikings start with fishing and hunting and look what the kind of resources we have ivory and clams so I already have the technologies to improve all the special tiles in my capital despite awkward starting technologies and on top of that well, it alters my tech path as well, because with a start like this, you're probably going to want the food sooner than later. So I am actually opted to just start researching sailing right from go. And a work boat first is reasonably obvious. You want to improve your food first, and all I have is seafood. So I'll build a work boat. Really, any of those ivory tiles wouldn't have been too bad to settle on, but there's really not much incentive to move off the plane till. Because if you put a camp on a Riverside Ivory, you get the three coastal commerce from settling on from uh, the camp. Uh, not coastal commerce, Riverside commerce. You get one bonus commerce for a camp. You have a one commerce for just the, the tile being ivory, and so you get a bonus one for being financial. Speaking of financial, that brings me to the traits that Ragnar, the leader of the Vikings, has. Uh, his first trait is aggressive, so all melee get combat one, also all gunpowder get combat one, and you get double uh, production speed of barracks. And right off the bat, we see something we don't like, which is Tokugawa. Now, when I was playing, I thought he was coming from the west, so I was a little bit concerned, I don't know why I thought he was coming from the west, about uh, him declaring on me. And uh, part of my reasoning for that, he's a 35 unit prob, he will not trade or open borders unless he's at least pleased, so he will not open borders with you at Cautious, unlike virtually every other AI, and most other AI will trade at Cautious, other than like, you know, the likes of Shaka and Ragnar and them, they won't, or Stalin, but most will trade at Cautious, and almost everyone, actually everyone but Togawa will open borders at Cautious, so that kind of screws me up. He also builds as many units as Montezuma, and he's pretty aggressive. He'll even plot war at pleased. Although, if you get him to pleased, he generally will not plot war on you, just because he's a hateful dude and he'll find other targets. So, yeah. I let my capital grow to pop 2 here, because it was about to do so, and I figured it would help with the worker and get me some extra commerce. Always a welcome thing with a start like that, where you have to research a lot of technologies to reach your potential. So uh, yeah, I let myself go to two and then build a worker to get going on the ivory and help crank out the remaining work boats more easily. You can't direct the wind, but you can adjust your sail. All right. So I get sailing, and that obviously is going to be an extra food for every water tile in my capital, and especially the water specials. And I deliberated a bit here what I should do, and I was really fearing the early war with Tokugawa, so. I opted to choose the mining and bronze working path eventually. I clicked the wheel there as a placeholder while I thought about it. Because yeah, sometimes these things take some thought. 
Anyway, I'll move on to Ragnar's other trait, which is Financial. And Financial is a good trait, but also one of the most overrated traits at the same time. That's because people think it's far and away the best trait, uh, overpowered, nothing can compare with it. And that's bull that's BS. There's no way. It, pretty much, I would say most of the traits are competitive with Financial when used properly. But the thing about Financial that differentiates it is it's really easy to use. Uh, for example, to use Expansive, you really have to take care to emphasize the rate at which you can set up cities, get your granary going uh, very early, grow your cities quickly, take advantage of the worker bonuses, and uh, health bonuses, which are not always very visible to people, but they're significant, especially as you grow a little bit. Or, for example, yeah, Imperialistic requires a little bit more active leveraging to take uh, advantage of the great general aspect of it. And philosophical requires good great person management and so on. Whereas with financial, it's pretty straightforward. You get a two commerce tile, it's now a three commerce tile. So you slap a cottage down and work it for ten turns, or you slap it down on Riverside, and you're at three commerce. If you work a coast tile, you're at three commerce. So financial has that going for it. It's a one trick pony. Yeah, you basically are encouraged to abuse commerce tiles, specifically cottages. But it's a good trick, and even though I would say it's far from being overpowering or anything, it's it's a solid trait. I mean, it's up there. It's one of the better economic traits, don't get me wrong. But it's definitely overrated. Now, on this map though, it could be useful potentially, because quality land tiles are going to be in short supply since we're on a water heavy map, and the bonuses to the coast are now one of the more frequent tiles we'll encounter, and we're more likely to work them early in the game. So, now financial is the potential to be useful. And it also synergizes well with the Colossus. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but Colossus Coast is better than cottages, unless the cottages are in Riverside Grassland or Riverside Floodplains. Yes, otherwise it takes like 80 turns for a cottage to break even with the Colossus Coast. Um, basically from like the time most people can get, you know, from 180 to liberalism or anything like that, you still haven't paid back working a cottage. And not only does it take 80 turns for it to have a direct payback, but that's without factoring in the advantages of getting to earlier technology sooner, getting to trade potentials sooner, getting to extra uh, research multipliers such as Oxford University sooner. So by the time you factor all that, it's probably well over 100 turns before a you know, cottage truly catches up to Colossus Coast. And by that point, you're looking like mid-game, where you have pretty much every tile improvement that you can build has the chance to be viable. So and you also have Emancipation by around then, where uh, the returns of working cottages is not as poor. So. Really, Colossus Coast is superior to non-Riverside Grassland or Floodplain Cottages. And the Colossus is a better wonder than people give it credit for. And at this point, I realized that Tokugawa was actually to my north, and that the border pop from my capital would be sufficient to uh, block him off. So, at this point, I'm also considering Great Lighthouse. A great Lighthouse gives you two extra trade routes per coastal city, which is incredible. If you have foreign trade, that can be amazing. So at this point in the game, I'm already considering just uh, gifting Tokugawa a settler in a cruddy location and trying to get open borders with him. Because that's really worthwhile, both because I might not have to plot war. As you can see, I already espionage on him, so he met somebody else, and he's almost certainly not pleased with them unless they're like Shaka or something. Which I'll curse my luck if that happens. So, gifting him a city like that, especially a cruddy one that he can't use very well, that would be pretty ideal. And also, since I went ironworking and my closest iron was reasonably far away, I just opted to. Uh, go for archery. I have pretty good commerce in the capital with the ivory and all the seafood. So I'm like, screw it, I'll get archers. Let's not mess around. If Tohu declares early, we can hold him off then. We have Hill City in the capital, which is what he'll be attacking. And hill archers are pretty dominant. 
thanks to the 50% bonus they get from being on hills, on top of the 50% bonus that the archers get for being in cities. So, that's some um, good extra defense. And I pick up archery. Do not throw the arrow, which will return. And at this point, I believe I do settle on masonry for their lighthouse. And I also start working my over to the next city. But that's for next time. I'll see you guys in the next video. Me and team signing out.